C.W. Jatube, have you read a book called My Beloved Religion and the Governing, I think you mean Governing Body, by Rolf Rulli? And if you did, what are your thoughts about it? I have read most of it. I did not read it like cover to cover, but I read most of the chapters. I went to specific chapters, sections in the book that I wanted to know to know what Rolf was thinking about. I do have it. And I will go back and finish it, but I'm so busy. I just, if I had to finish it, I would have. But I, I read enough to know where Rolf was coming from. <laughs> it was it was pretty clear to me pretty quickly. But then I read, um, you know, what he had to say about the new New World Translation and different things. Um, my thoughts about it. So obviously Rolf has come to a position similar to what I came to in 2003 that, you know, I, I tried to explain and I did explain in my three dissertations basically, right, that, that the level of authority that the governing body claims is not biblical. It's not, it's not biblical, right? You can just look at the account of Paul and Peter in Galatians 2 and, and others like Barnabas and other Jews who were with Peter. Did Paul say, well, you know, Peter, you're appointed, you were directly appointed three times by Jesus, feed my little sheep. I better not question you. No. No, he didn't do that at all, did he? He went right up to him and said, listen, how can you as a Jew do these things when you know what's been fulfilled in the Christ and you're going to you're going to you're going to set this pattern all over again you know how can you do these things and and we don't have any record of Peter saying listen Paul you know you're pretty new here you're a newbie okay we don't have verification of your your visions or anything we know where we come from we were with him we were with him when he was on earth Paul did Peter do that? No. <laughs> he even allude, refers to Paul in his writings as you know having things that are hard to explain sometimes. I guarantee you what he told them that day, according to Galatians 2, wasn't hard to understand. Peter got that message loud and clear. And he, and he accepted it. From, from all accounts that we can tell, he accepted it and stopped acting wrongly. He started acting correctly rightly if paul hadn't done that we would have had a lot more problems a lot earlier on and the problem we have with you know the watchtower today isn't just the governing body it's the people in it now, i'm not saying all the people are bad right i think i think highly of many of them actually just like I have many people in other religions that I don't think are correct structurally that I think highly of. They're good people in the sense that they, I think they mean well. They're trying to do the best they can. No one's perfect, right? We don't want to make people out to be better than they are, right? Don't Even Jesus said, don't, why do you call me good, right? We know who's good, the one I'm following. That That's who's good. The problem is, as I've explained in my, um, in my, my two videos on the Watchtower Apologist Collapse series, in fact, I have part three coming on that at some point. I've been trying. I don't want to make Watchtower people like to watch the show. And I, I like a lot of them. I get along with a lot of them. And I'm not here to bash the Watchtower or anyone, really. But I'm not here to make them just totally feel like they don't have any problems. We know that's not true. And if they don't do something about it soon, they're just going to have more problems. Like with Peter and Paul. If Peter, if P Paul didn't do what he did, when he did it, it would have been much worse, much sooner. And right now, what we have is a situation where, you know, the Watchtower organization for a long time was able to attract people like me because of things like the divine name, the, the clear teaching on no trinity, right? Love, a love among the races and not promoting war and things like that. I think they go too far with banning people from politics, right? That's not biblical. In fact, that's actually against what we can show us in the Bible, but... In any case, they, they definitely get high marks for not wanting to promote war and, and they promote love among races. I don't care what any of the former witnesses say who like to argue that, well, there's 
some racial things. No, look, I was a witness for quite a while. And I can tell you, while there may be instances and there may be exceptions, by and large, you know, we're taught to love all humans as members of the Watchtower, Joe's Witnesses. We are taught to accept everybody. Okay, at least I was and everyone I know. So I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to even, it's just not tolerable that, that anything but that is true. And so maybe at certain times in certain ways, right? Everyone's imperfect. There's not like 100% every single person at all times in the history of the Watchtower wasn't a racist. But overall, some of the overall good quality attributes of the Watchtower organization were the divine name, no trinity, you know, trying to accurately translate the Bible apart from these traditions. Is it is it accurate in every place? No. But it does a lot better than all these Trinitarian Bibles, I'll tell you that. Just like we're, we're seeing in my uh, uh, moral and translational superiority of the NWT series. And I have a lot more on that. Love among themselves, right? There's a lot of good things I can point to in the Watchtower organization. But there are some things that are a problem. And one, and one of those things is, is the authority that the governing body has taken upon itself, right? We can't question them. You're not allowed to Matthew 18 them. You can't go to them and say, listen, you guys keep writing about dates, times, and seasons. And Paul tells us in Thessalonians, first and second, we don't need to do that. We don't need anything to be written about like that. We, we just need to be to know that it's a thief in the night and that's it. We're not supposed to get excited about things like that. He uses that word in 2 Thessalonians. I'll pull it up. So why, why are we getting excited? Why are you guys so excited about these dates, times, and seasons? It says specifically and explicitly not to do that. Let me pull up the specific text. Where he talks about that. In 2 Thessalonians 2. In fact, I'll pull it up for all of us. We'll do the uh, we'll do the shared reading. Let's bring up the NWT. Split screen. So one of the problems as I've been talking about is that, that the organization today. You can't question the governing body, right? They don't make themselves subject to anybody except themselves. Whereas Peter, although directly appointed by the Lord three times, nobody denies this. It didn't matter. Paul showed courage and said, I don't care. You're teaching what's false. What did Jesus say, Peter? Everyone who's on the side of the truth listens to my voice. You're not listening to the truth, Peter. You're going backwards. We'll get to First Thessalonians in a minute, but look at look at what what often isn't brought up is Second Thessalonians. Look at Second Thessalonians two. One and two, he says. However, brothers, respecting the presence, parousia, right? This is like the thing with the Watchtower organization, the chronology, parousia from nineteen fourteen. Right? Tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and uh, sign of your presence? However, brothers, respecting the presence of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together to him, we request you. This is something they're asking Christians to do. This is what Paul and the brothers with him are asking those Christians and by extension us, if we claim to be Christians, we're, we're making this request not to be quickly shaken from your reason, nor be excited. I think there was a talk recently where um, I saw Jeffrey Jackson, a member of the governing body, and he was talking about how um, people might say, well, you know, you guys have said these dates and stuff, and he and he said, well, yeah, you know, there's times where we've gotten excited. And right when I heard him say that, I thought of this verse. I'm thinking, you're not supposed to be getting excited, okay? You're, you're told right here. It's like just plain language in a simple letter. 
nor to be excited either through an inspired expression, right? So you're interpreting the Bible, inspired expressions. You're not supposed to get excited over those, Jeffrey. Sorry, you're, you were incorrect. You were in error and you should apologize. And then he went on to say something like, well, you know, if a guard dog um, barks loud at night and wakes everybody up, but there's no one there, you don't shoot the dog. Do you guys remember if you've seen, if you've watched at JW.org, he, he, he said that in one of his talks. And when he said that, I'm thinking, well, yeah, no, we don't go out and shoot the dog if it keeps barking. But we'll spank its ass if it doesn't stop, right? We'll tell it to shut up. Has anybody told the governing body after they got excited and kept barking loudly in the night and no one was there to shut up? Can you guys shut up and stop barking while we're trying to rest at the night when we're told it's okay to rest? Okay, we know the thief is coming. We get it. We're prepared. The door's locked. We don't need you barking all night long. Can you stop barking when no one's there, Jeffrey? Can you stop getting excited from an inspired expression or th through an inspired expression or a verbal message or through a letter as though from us to the effect that the day of Jehovah or the Lord is here? That's exactly what they do, right? They get everybody excited because of an inspired expression in the Bible or a letter in the Bible or a letter from them, right? The, when a letter comes from the governing body, everybody gets excited. Well, what are they going to say? What's the new light, you know? To the effect that the day of... You're not supposed to be writing about that stuff. It says right here, we're asking you not to do this. If they keep doing it, and then they downplay it like Jackson did. Yeah, we may have gotten excited. Oh, well, you're not supposed to do that. Do not get excited, Jeffrey. Okay, did you read that verse? See, I can't go to Jackson and say, Jeffrey, Matthew 18, I love you. I think you want to do well, but you keep getting excited. And, and this text right here says you're not supposed to get excited from an inspired expression or a verbal message as though from one of the apostles. To the effect that the day of Jehovah is here. You're not supposed to be exciting people about that. And that is exactly what they keep doing. And now the problem is nobody believes them. Nobody, nobody's really excited anymore. See, for a while, because of the 1914 chronology and because of its attachment to the generation, it made people a little more concerned because of the proximity, right? It's like, well, it can't be that much long farther away then. If this is true, then we don't have much time left. And that's exactly how they presented it for decades, that's what we thought every time the memorial would come around, you know, when we would look at the number of partakers and think, well, it's getting lower, right? It's getting closer, all right? You guys know what I'm talking about. So they're deliberately and rep repetitively, repeatedly <laughs> violating this text. And I can't confront them about it, right? I, if I talk to them about it, if I tell the congregations, hey, listen, brothers, they keep telling us and getting excited and getting us excited about the, the day of the Lord being near or here. This is wrong. We're not supposed to do that. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. They throw me out, right? Because they're more loyal to them than to this. And, and that's our other problem today with the Watchtower Society. The governing body is not listening to the text where it should. We can't go to them about it, Matthew 18, the way we should. And they don't have any courageous people, right? They don't have anyone left. Rolf was one of the few last ones. And when I, when I left in 2003, when I did three dissertations, and I'm like, look, you know, there's just, they, 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 they're, they're too legalistic, right? They keep, 
requiring things from people that don't make any sense more than the Bible says you're required to do. I thought Rolf was just going to keep supporting them no matter what. So maybe there are still people in there that I just don't know have that courage. But I, I know some who are in there. I know a couple who are in there who have the courage. They are doing some things, but it's just very hard, right? Because their whole family, their whole lineage, and their whole life is, is tied to the organization. Now, Rolf is actually, I think, in, in many ways, helping a lot of these people. Because whereas I wasn't as well known in the society, I became kind of well known with the whole, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses defended and stuff. But Rolf was really well known in the organizational sense. You know what I'm saying? So when when he did what he did, excuse me, in around what I think 2013 or something like that, that got a lot more people who who wouldn't normally have been as affected, it, it got to them more. And so I, I know for a fact that more people are now like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, um, you guys, you guys may be going way too far, just like Greg and Rolf were saying. And like other people, other people before us have had, have said things, right? There's people like Ray Franz, but Ray Franz also simultaneously promoted false doctrine. Right? He, he didn't just promote his experiences and disagreements organizationally or structurally. He presented terrible arguments against the form of the divine name that is most... This, the terrible arguments against Jehovah. Right? He promoted Yahweh, which is not God's name. It's not even close to it in the final part of the name. Right? Nobody disagrees about the Yah part. But there's no evidence for the way. And yet... You know, he didn't take the time to really, he just, because I think Ray Franz saw the divine name, like I mentioned a few moments ago, as part of the lure, part of the reasons why people join. So he just tried to attack everything that he didn't think was correct instead of finding out the way maybe he found out some other things were not correct. So I, I just don't think Ray Franz did as much of a service as he could have if he would have stuck to what he knew and left out what he really didn't know enough about to speak on. And so we get a lot of ex-witnesses today totally confused about the divine name, thinking it shouldn't be anywhere in the New Testament, thinking it's Yahweh. And it just makes, it makes it harder for people like me to get the truth through to people who still believe in Jesus, but who now are misled on divine name issues, right? So either way, I think Ray Franz probably did more good than not by at least trying to stop the organizational madness, right? Because he was all in that whole 1975 thing. And 1975 is where they, again, they got everyone excited. You're not supposed to do that, people. Look, Watchtower people, if you're watching this, you know. I defend what I think is correct wherever I can. I have a whole series in support of the Bible translation you use, okay? I've defended your doctrine, and still do, in very significant ways. But it's time for you to be honest with yourselves and other people. Okay? There's a problem structurally with your organization. And it's not that hard to find. It's right here. You know where else it is? Right here. As for the times and seasons, brothers, you need... Nothing. Nothing. You, you need nothing. Okay, so spiritual food at the proper time. We need that, right? When it comes to times and seasons, what do we need? Nothing. So how could it be food at the proper time? It can't be. Because we don't need it. In fact, look at all the damage it's done. Look at the damage that violating 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4 has done. It's made you lose credibility, right? More people are leaving today than ever because the threat of the generation and, and it being so near with 1914, 
and you've changed your view of the generation. It's this overlapping thing, which makes no sense, right? <laughs> Just because you're a contemporary of someone who saw events that happened before doesn't mean that you actually saw those events, and so it wouldn't make any sense. And yet here we are. So the damage that has been done by not listening to these texts and just promoting the one God, promoting the divine name is incredible, right? I mean, you, you've, you've done this to yourselves and all you had to do was follow 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2 and right here. For you yourselves know quite well the Lord's day, it says Jehovah's day, but it shouldn't be that. It should be the Lord's here. It's not a quote. Come in exactly as a thief in the night, right? That's it. You need to know more than that. Hey, there's someone's going to break into your house. You don't know when. Be ready, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's enough for me. I'll be ready every night. I'll make sure I lock it. I'll make sure everything's secure. I'll, I'll be, be, you know, get enough sleep. I'll try to be a light sleeper, right? I mean, is that not enough? It's enough. It says so right here. That's enough. You don't need anything to be written to you about these things. And yet that's what they do more than anything else. And they've caused themselves a lot of suffering and pain for it. So I think Rolf is doing a good work in now trying to, I think like me, help people still have their faith, right? See, for, for me, and I, I think for Rolf too, although I haven't spoken directly with him, I've communicated to him through others a little bit, but I don't want to speak for him. I, but I, I know Rolf a little bit, or at least I did. And I, I know the kind of mindset you'd have to have. And I've read part of his book um, on the governing body, my beloved religion. So I can, I can see where he's coming from. He still believes in the Bible, right? He's not turned his back on the Bible. He still believes in Jesus, I think. Still believes in Jehovah, the God of the Bible. Still believes in the golden rule. He just realizes now we've got this problem. We've got these people that have taken it upon themselves to appoint themselves above everybody else. And they're not accountable to anybody but themselves. And they keep violating these texts openly. And forcing everybody who's a part of their group to agree with them or you're out. Or you have to leave your family, right? It's just all this stuff. And yet we also know in Revelation 2, too, what? That people who claimed they were apostles, Jesus approved of those who didn't just accept it, but who questioned them and found they were lying. He said that was a good thing. You can't do that in the organization today. They disfellowshipped Rolf. Right? They just considered me disassociated, I guess. But Rolf, they disfellowshipped. Right? And and the other people I know, other than a few, a few people I know who are there, who I think really want to do something, but they're just kind of like situationally paralyzed, right? I mean, they could just throw themselves on the on the sacrificial pole, but it wouldn't do as much good as maybe staying in in some sense and preparing because I think structurally they're going to keep breaking down. And I think they're not going to be able to hold this together for a lot longer because people can see it. People are now more and more aware and it just does, it's not believable anymore, right? And the danger is that they're going to make a lot of people not believe in what is believable uh, still, and that is in the God of the Bible, the Messiah of the Bible, the divine name, right? We, they are not necessary for those things. No, they're not the channel. They are not the channel that we have to belong to to be approved. No, no, no. Okay, we know that's not true. They're openly violating these texts. That's all you need to know, okay? If that's not all you need to know, then what else do you need to know? What's your test? How about this? Since the 1930s, they've been separating Christians, their own group, into two groups, right? Anointed and non-anointed. And they've been identifying the majority of their organization as what? Great crowd. And yet we know what? Where does the great crowd come from? Let's take a look. Revelation. So, I mean, they read this all the time, do they not? This is like one of the most frequently quoted texts 
in watchtower studies, I would say. Right, so it gives the uh, 144,000. I've done a whole show on this, so if you want more on that, take a look. And then it says, after these things, I saw and look a great crowd. No man was able to number out of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues, right? And so I believe these are the same nations in Matthew 25 that are gathered before the throne. And that because of the way they treat the Christians, represented by spiritual Israel, the 144,000, but it's not, in my view, a literal number. Like Jesus says, you, 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 you were good to my brother, so you were good to me, you're approved. I believe that's who these are. Right, And then that's why when the other says, these who are dressed in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? Right now, I've had someone try to tell me that this question is similar to the question that the nations asked Jesus. Well, when did we see you, Lord? Right? But that's not true, right? Because, because my point in Matthew 25 is they don't, they don't know the people that they're treating well, Christ's brothers. They don't know who they are. That's why they ask him the question, when did we treat you well, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't every Jehovah's Witness or Christian who knows about Matthew 25 and Revelation 7 know that when Jesus comes to separate the sheep and the goats, wouldn't, would they be confused about how they're being approved? And if you're, on the, if you're on the sheep side and you're being approved in Matthew 25, wouldn't you know <laughs> if, if those are Christians... And you've read Matthew 25, you would know, well, I'm being approved because I help the people. Right? Even the society says, we're his brothers. You have to treat us well, so you're approved. right? So especially the Watchtower Jehovah's Witnesses, they would have to know that. So how are they going to ask the question, when did we see you? They already know. That's their whole point. That you, we're Christ's brothers and you have to treat us well in order to be approved. So they can't possibly fulfill Matthew 25 as the great crowd of other sheep, of those sheep. Because they know exactly in their minds who are Christ's brothers and how they're treating them. And that in their view, it's the basis for their approval. The nations gathered before his throne don't know that. They're non-Christians who treat Christ's brothers well without realizing that's who they are. That's why, now the difference between that question, right, that they clearly don't know, versus this question here, the, one of the elders in heaven asked John, these who are dressed in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? You know what the difference is? The next verse. So right away I said to him, my Lord, you are the one that knows. I had a, a watchtower witness try to argue with me that just because in Matthew 25, the nations ask, well, where did we see you? Doesn't mean they don't know. Well, does it say anywhere in Matthew 25 that they do know? Because right here it does. He tried to use this verse right here, verse 13. And yet he, it's a rhetorical question. In Matthew 25, it is not a rhetorical question. And here it's explicitly one. So it's a false analogy, right? It's just, they can't stop trying to protect their doctrine. It's like we were talking about earlier with the Trinity. I can be a smart person no matter what. If their doctrine is threatened, they panic because their loyalty is not to the text. If it was, they wouldn't be getting so excited, would they? What does the text say? Nor to be excited through a written, an inspired expression or, the, or a letter as though from us. So it's not hard to see what the answer is. But look at what else he says. He says, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Right? First, he says, these are the ones that come out of the great tribulation. And then they wash their robes, right? So the nations in Matthew 25, they're, they're, at the, they're in the great tribulation, right? The, the, the Messiah has returned. All nations are gathered. And this is it, right? They're going forward to inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the founding of the earth, just like it was originally intended. New heavens, new earth. Originally intended, but then, of course, after the fall, you know, that the, the promised seed would come and restore it all. They then wash their robes, right? So why would Christians need to do that? Christians are already expressing faith 
in the ransom sacrifice, we're already cleansed through our faith in the Christ. It's the nations who aren't Christians who need to do this. That's why they don't know who Christ's brothers are. And that's why they have to wa have their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's also why it says earlier in Revelation 2 that the one that conquers and observes his deeds down to the end, he'll give authority over nations. The same nations that in Matthew 25 are approved because of how they treated the people who are going to be ruling over them. And it says he'll shepherd the people with an iron rod and they'll be broken to pieces. Right? Because some of the nations that get approved for how they treated Christ's brothers in Matthew 25, they're not all going to stay alive because we haven't reached the point where the second resurrection comes at the end of the thousand years and where the dead are all brought up judged according to their deeds and those who are judged worthy for life live on those who are not are destroyed forever and death is destroyed forever and everything that is bad is destroyed forever right death and hades are hurled in the lake of fire just like and then first corinthians 15 says death where is your sting right so that's when jesus accomplishes everything and turns it back over to the father after the thousand years but during the thousand years right there's going to be people from that group that were brought before the throne that are the nations who are washing their robes and making them white in the blood of the Lamb, but they're still being shepherded by those who have been sealed as Christians, who are Christ's brothers, the ones who are the basis for the approval according to how the nations treat them. Okay, so I wanted to summarize that view, but, but to use it to point out this. The Watchtower Society has been identifying the majority of its members as the great crowd that's not even here yet. Right? Rutherford pointed to the whole audience and said, Behold, the great crowd. Well, did the tribulation just end? Is that what he was trying to say? Because they don't even believe the, trib the great tribulation has started yet. So then we know, even according to their own writings, the great crowd is not here. Because the great crowd is not are not Christians. They're the nations who are judged according to how they treat the Christians and then who are ruled over by the Christians. Right here. So, the, the, the other problem is they're, they're not letting Christians be Christians. Right? They can't partake. Right? They just pass it right by like I used to, but not anymore, of course, because now I know, I understand better. But the mindset is such that they, they already have them thinking they're past the Great Tribulation. And they have them thinking they have to keep treating them well in order to be saved. See? So they're self-identifying in a way that puts them above other people who want to be Christians when they're supposed to be serving each other like the Master did, right? They're supposed to be washing each other's feet. Not putting yourself above others and them at your feet. And then forbidding them to partake of the emblems because of a misinterpretation of these texts. Because you can't determine that the Great Tribulation is next. So if it's not here now and it hasn't been here for this whole time, you've been saying the Great Crowd has been here almost a hundred years. That's a lot of people you've kept from uniting to the Christ through partaking of the emblems. That is that is not a good track record, okay? That's got to stop. My goal, as someone who used to be, you know, a member of the society, is to point out the good things that are there, the reasons why many of us joined, not ignore the obvious problems, right? The fact that they put themselves above other people. We cannot confront them, Matthew 18. They keep getting excited over things and barking in the middle of the night and they won't accept punishment like a dog would. Hey, well, if you're the dog, Jeffrey, you get punishment when you don't act like a dog should, like a well-trained dog, okay? So they want, they want the best of, of both worlds. They want to be able to do whatever they want and not be held accountable. You know, well, you know what that's going to do? 
it's going to make them doubly accountable to the one to whom I would hate to have to pay a double accounting. So they're going to answer for it. Sorry. You should not be promoting these humans the way they want you to. Promote the truth. Promote true doctrine. Even if it's watched hard doctrine, it doesn't matter. I see a lot of former witnesses get so angry and bothered by the things I was just talking about, they can't take any of it. And they just throw it all out. Well, I don't think Rolf is doing that. I know I'm not doing that. And I know a lot of other people are trying to do the best we can by just pointing to what is true, what it has the best available reasons behind it, not promoting humans as though we're better than we really are, not openly violating texts that tell us we don't need anything to be written about these things, right? not getting excited, like I said, not misidentifying a whole group of people. <laughs> that was a big one. I can't believe they've maintained that for this long. But see, it, it's all been a part of this timeline that they've connected with 1914 and the generation and their belief that it's so close, you're, pretty, you're practically the great crowd, right? That's basically what they're saying. We're so close, it's going to happen like tomorrow and so it'll be you, so just it's you. Right? That's about the only way you could look at it, and yet it's not true. It's not even true that those are going to be the people who are going to be approved on Jesus' right hand. It's the nations who haven't washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So some things need to change. I hope Rolf is successful in helping people, not making it worse for them, like I think Ray Franz did in many ways, because I don't think Ray Franz had as much faith. I think he... He still pro professed to be a Christian. Maybe he was. But I don't think he did a very good job on that part of it. I think, I think he gave token service to the elements of Christianity that really would have kept people motivated after leaving the society once he demotivated them from being a part of the society. I have, I have much more hope and belief that, that Rolf and, and myself will be able to help people keep their faith, proclaim the divine name, by all the, the real good reasons we came into the society for, for in the first place, unless you came in because of all this chronology and stuff, then I just then I have no, no sympathy for you, right? You should know better. But if you came in because of wanting to do good and, and teach the truth, then I think you still need to go forward with it, right? 